Welcome to the Escape the Frying Pan video. We're going to delve into why I want to escape this frying pan, and let's see if I do it by the end. What if I told you that a little-known group of chemicals has accumulated in your body and has the potential to do you great harm? For example, both males and females are affected by thyroid cancer, cholesterol problems, liver damage, and kidney cancer. Females are affected by increased levels of breast cancer, and males are affected by increased levels of testicular cancer. Babies may have birth defects and lower birth weights. Then later in life, they may have delayed mammary gland development, reduced response to vaccines, weak immune systems, reduced fertility, and other negative traits. What if I told you that the companies producing these chemicals earn $4 to $6 billion in profits annually, while costing taxpayers $17.5 trillion annually? I think you'll agree there's something wrong with this situation. What if I told you that this is a global problem that you can't escape from? These chemicals have been found in your food, in your water, in your blood, and in your organs. They're found at the north end of our planet in Arctic polar bears, at the south end of our planet in Antarctic penguins, in whales far out to sea, and in people, no matter how far they are from industry. In fact, they're found throughout the world. Shockingly, they're not breaking down. They're bioaccumulating and biomagnifying. More on that later. Does all this seem like some kind of horror show? In fact, it's all true, and you can verify this yourself from sources I'll give you before the end of the video. Please tell your friends and like and subscribe to help support this channel. Bear with me for the next few minutes while I walk you through a bit of chemistry so that you can understand these dangerous chemicals. I'm talking about per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. I'm going to call them PFAS from now on, but let me explain where the name comes from. The P in PFAS comes from either per or poly, more about that in a minute. The F comes from fluoro, meaning that fluorine atoms are involved. The A comes from alkyl, more about that in a minute, and the S comes from substances. All PFAS chemicals have a backbone of carbon atoms, shown in blue, surrounded by other atoms. If a chemical is a carbon chain surrounded by atoms such as hydrogens, it's called an alkyl. This structure of carbon atoms bonded into a chain is so common that chemists often don't show the carbon atoms. They just show the other atoms that are bonded to the carbon chain. In this case, all hydrogen atoms. By the way, the fatty acids of your diet look like this. No wonder your body would readily accept and incorporate any molecule that looks like this, including PFAS. If some of those hydrogens were replaced by fluorine atoms, we'd call it a polyfluoroalkyl substance. That's one kind of PFAS. If all of those hydrogen atoms were replaced with fluorine atoms, we'd call it a perfluoroalkyl substance. That's the other kind of PFAS. Both per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances are included in the term PFAS. There are thousands of variations of PFAS. How do you get thousands of variations out of this chemical structure? Well, you could add more fluorines and more carbons to the fluorinated carbon chain. And that carbon chain could be long or short, linear or branched. Each variation of this could have exciting new chemical properties. Or you can add some chemicals to the right side of this diagram. Each new functional group of chemicals may yield exciting new properties and products. No wonder industry has been so enthusiastic about PFAS chemicals. So now you know what PFAS is. Doesn't it look a little familiar now? It's just a fluorinated carbon chain joined to a functional group. By the way, the example I've been showing you is 8,2-FTAC. It's used in waterproofing and as a precursor to creating other kinds of PFAS chemicals. For that example, in every PFAS chemical, the fluorine carbon bond is very strong, one of the strongest bonds in chemistry. And that is why PFAS chemicals are very stable. They resist time, lasting decade after decade, maybe for a thousand years. And that's why we call them forever chemicals. Because they're so stable, they can also resist heat and be used in applications where other chemicals would melt or burn. Plus, they repel water and oil. That's why industries have loved PFAS chemicals. They're super useful. On the other hand, they're super dangerous to us because they last so long, they accumulate in the environment and in our bodies, and they cause us many serious harms. A quick bit of history. PFAS chemicals received a big boost from the space program because their special properties made them very useful for spacesuits and for components within spacecrafts. 
Even before that, they received a huge boost from the Manhattan Project, where they were used to concentrate uranium for the bomb and to make essential components that could resist great heat. Closer to home, Teflon frying pans brought PFAS into every household and were a huge hit for the industry. Food won't stick to Teflon. It's not that wonderful a trait, not worth risking your health, I'd say, but some people seem impressed. Here's why it works. In the ordinary frying pan next to me, there are voids or imperfections in the surface, and so food gets cooked into those little spots and the rest of the food sticks. In the ordinary frying pan beyond there, cooking with oil, the food floats on top of the oil and doesn't stick. In the Teflon pan beyond that, it has a smooth and slick surface. Those little fluorine atoms sticking up repel oil and water, and so the food won't stick. Teflon is so smooth and slippery that this gecko that can climb walls and run across ceilings can't escape this Teflon frying pan even when prompted by a finger. PFAS chemicals are also used in firefighting foams and medical products like tubing, water repellent clothing, scientific equipment, stain resistant fabrics, personal products like makeup and dental floss, food packaging, and cleaning products. So, what's the problem? PFAS chemicals have escaped. As I mentioned, PFAS are building up everywhere, from the North Pole to the South Pole, out at sea and in people everywhere. They're in rain and snow now, so there's no escaping them. It's in food, food packaging, and in the oil and waterproof papers and pizza boxes that we put around our fast food. It's in drinking water. Most of the big court cases so far have been about water pollution. It's in the air, not just fumes, but dust far from original sources. It's in milk that we drink to get healthy. And it's in mother's milk. Think about this. A baby can receive PFAS chemicals from its mother well in the womb, possibly affecting its DNA and resulting in birth defects. Then the baby is fed PFAS in mother's milk, affecting its growth, its ability to learn, its immune system, and its fertility. That's a lot of control to give to a chemical in exchange for some convenient products. And just when we think we've thrown PFAS away, it outlasts the products it was part of and comes back to us as groundwater pollution and soil contamination. Again, we know that PFAS chemicals do us many great harms, and that will only increase as concentrations of PFAS chemicals build up and as more research is done. As I mentioned before, PFAS chemicals are not breaking down. They're bioaccumulating and biomagnifying. This diagram was designed to illustrate bioaccumulation and biomagnification of mercury in fish, but it works for PFAS chemicals too, and even more so because PFAS chemicals are going to last for a long, long time. Tiny creatures called krill live in water, and if PFAS chemicals are in that water, then it's going to soak into their bodies through the process of bioaccumulation, and that goes for all the other fishy creatures that live in that water. Biomagnification is when fish like salmon and pollock eat hundreds to thousands of krill in their lifetimes, thereby taking on the PFAS chemicals that were in the krill. Fish like trout and tuna then biomagnify it further by eating lots of salmon and pollock in their lifetimes. And fish like sharks and pike biomagnify it even further by eating lots of trout and tuna in their lifetimes. People are exposed to PFAS chemicals in fish when they eat somewhere on this food chain gaining lower quantities if they eat lower on the food chain and higher quantities if they eat higher on the food chain. Looking back over time, some people say that the Manhattan Project brought us two serious consequences, the bomb, which we'll live under for the rest of our days, and forever chemicals. Do forever chemicals deserve to be taken as seriously as the bomb? Think about this. Let's say that the PFAS chemicals that have been released into the world up to today may last for a thousand years, that's more than 30 generations of your family that will have to deal with them. What about the PFAS chemicals that are being released every day moving forward? Will there even be 30 generations of your family if disease and fertility issues increase with increasing PFAS concentrations? It's a big problem that we need to solve ASAP. Can we count on the companies that created these chemicals to clean them up? Well, they have a scandalous history. Moving forward from the 40s, they knew that these chemicals were building up in their employees, but they thought they were harmless at that time. Companies knew from the 1960s that there were harms. I'm going to read to you from my notes so that I'm accurate with the facts. 
So in the 1960s, companies knew that employees were showing serious health problems and that experiments with rats were showing liver enlargement and toxicity, but they didn't tell anyone. In the 70s, the companies knew that PFAS was toxic, that if you injected it into monkeys, they'd die, that it depressed immune systems, and that it shouldn't be anywhere near food. But they didn't tell anyone, and they didn't stop using it in food packaging and cooking equipment. In the 80s, they were monitoring PFAS in their employees' blood as it increased, and saying nothing. They also knew that it was spreading into neighborhoods outside the factories. In the 90s, they knew that it was causing cancer and other ailments. It was much more widespread in water and at higher concentrations, and now they were concerned about being held liable. Still, they kept it all a secret. So they covered it up for years. When did they inform the public? Well, they haven't. They lost some big court cases between the year 2000 and the year 2023 on the basis of leaked memos that showed that they knew all the things that I've just described and covered them up purposely. They still haven't admitted fault or liability. Usually they just settle out of court with big payoffs. Luckily, some governments woke up to this and some of the worst PFAS were banned or regulated, notably PFOA and PFOS. So the company said, we'll use new PFAS that don't have any strikes against them. And maybe that's good, but we don't know if they'll turn out to be any safer. It takes time for PFAS to accumulate in the environment and in people's bodies. It takes time for diseases and problems to manifest themselves. It takes time for research to be done. And it takes time for regulations to be developed. Meanwhile, we've got the old PFAS around to clean up and deal with, and we don't know if the newer PFAS are going to be any safer. We'll have to wait and see. What are authorities doing? Now that attention has been drawn to this, PFAS are being studied. In some states and in Europe, PFAS are being banned or regulated, except for those that are deemed to be essential, such as those involved in medical tubing. There have been discussions about lowering recommended guidelines for drinking water. Since about 2016, there's been a guideline of 70 nanograms per liter for drinking water, and people are talking about lowering that to 30 nanograms per liter. But these are recommended guidelines, not regulations with legal teeth. And there's been talk about treating all PFAS as a group. So when a new PFAS is created, we don't have to wait for all the steps that I was talking about before, it's already regulated as it comes into the pool of PFAS. And of course, people have been talking about looking for substitutes that are not harmful. What can you do? You can pay attention to PFAS, you can try and limit your exposure, you can question politicians, and you can press government for action. This isn't something that can readily be solved by individuals. We need government action. Try not to breathe PFAS fumes or dust. And you may think, that's easy, I just won't live next door to a PFAS factory. But it's not that easy. PFAS chemicals are concentrated at airports, military bases, landfills, sewage plants, farms that use sewage fertilizer, and so on. It comes to us in rain and snow and dust from our products. So now we have to be on guard against dust. Very importantly, you want to protect your drinking water. The big court cases seem to revolve around drinking water problems. And drinking water is something that we can have some control over. There are activated carbon filter systems that can take out 95 to 100% of PFAS from your drinking water. And there are reverse osmosis systems that can take out 99 to 100%. I'll put information about that in the area below the video. Coming back to Teflon frying pans, they're not made with PFOA anymore, so they're safer in that regard. Since about 2016, how old's your frying pan? But even with a new Teflon frying pan, they can release toxic fumes if overheated, and that's why you don't heat them up without food in them. They can also release toxic shavings if scraped, and that's why you don't scrape them with a metal utensil, but instead you use some sort of a plastic utensil. And in the manufacture and disposal of them, they create water, air, and waste pollution. Now, a lot of people these days are using air fryers and other devices to cook their food. I'll put some information about that in the area below the video. For further info, see the videos and sources below this video. Especially see the PFAS cover-up. Now, it's a long video and it's got some subtitles in it, but it's got lots of fantastic details. They've got good lawyers in deep pockets so they can afford to name names and point fingers. I'm going to let them do that. 
If you liked this video, please look for more Dr. Dave Ecologic videos and tell your friends. My next video will be a role play about PFAS. Role plays are fun and they let people step into somebody else's shoes and see things from their perspective. If you're interested in environmental science, I have a highly rated course at Udemy called Everyone's World, What You Need to Know About Your Environment. The link is in the description below. See you next video.